Perfect. All right, so purpose-driven tokens. Um, yeah, looking at the state of the token economy, um, I think we're in a very, very, very similar stage. Uh, if you think of tokens as the killer application of the Web3, and the backbone of the Web3 being blockchain networks and other distributed ledgers, um, we're at the very similar stage then, like early 1990s, when uh, actually we had the first visual websites and we had to figure out what we can meaningfully do with a website. And I don't think we're too far into the process of understanding what different types of token systems we can actually create. And uh, so, as I said, I would like to um, dedicate the time today to talk about the different type of token systems we could create um, to simplify, super simplify uh, in a first step. Um, we could distinguish between complex token systems and simple token systems. Now, simple uh, uh, and complex, these two words come, um, um, you have to see that in the context of complex systems um, uh, research. Uh, simple uh, in the context of complex systems research is any system that is not a complex system. That doesn't mean that these systems are super, um, in, um, they do have certain levels of complexity, but it's nowhere near the level of complexity and uh, the dynamics that you would find in complex systems. In the context of tokens, we can think of simple token systems. Uh, examples would be asset tokens, access right tokens, any type of identity token. These are things, um, kind of business models, governance models, things that we already know. Uh, uh, can economic, socioeconomic activities that we're already doing today, whether analog or digitized. Uh, we have processes, they have been stress tested. Uh, we have regulation around uh, assets, uh, securities, access, right to, uh, access rights, et cetera, uh, access right management, identity systems. And what we can do now with uh, in this Web3, we can tokenize all these things, and that might uh, bring more efficiency to those systems. Um, and the act of tokenization is predominantly a question of what I would like to refer to as legal engineering, the intersection of computer science and, um, and, and, and the law to try to make these kind of the, uh, to aid tokenize it. This is the computer science aspect and, and create the infrastructure. Uh, but on the uh, other hand, also do this in a legally compliant way. These are things we understand. Uh, it will take some time. It's complex enough, but it's, um, it's, it's something we understand. The dynamics are controllable to a certain extent. On the other hand, we have uh, complex token systems and these uh, Complex token systems are steered by purpose-driven tokens. Before we go into purpose-driven tokens, um, just uh, to conclude, because we won't deep, deep dive on the simple token. So what are these assets, access rights, identity uh, tokens that we can create? Really, um, it's uh, they're not mutually exclusive. We have an intersection of them, uh, but basically an asset token could be anything from a kilowatt hour of energy, fiat currencies, commodities, promises of a product, etc., downloads of a song, we can tokenize this. Um, uh, but also access rights such as software licenses or um, streaming of a song. But we can also uh, tokenize any type of identity-based systems like identifications uh, and, and um, certifications that are the basis of voting rights, memberships, uh, voting rights uh, connected to a share of a company, insurance policies, etc. We will not deep dive into that. Um, suffice to say, I would say uh, that I personally believe that um, these um, uh, simple token systems <laughs> that we can see in this slide, um, they're like kind of the gateway drug to the full tokenized economy. These are things we understand easily, and it's maybe comparable to SAP in the 90s. Uh, it doesn't change the business processes so as much as it uh, uh, makes it more efficient in the back end of operations. 
Now, on the other hand, we have complex systems uh, or uh, complex token systems that are zero-purpose-driven token, and I would say the first purpose-driven token was in fact Bitcoin, and uh, it enabled us to create decentralized autonomous organizations. Um, I don't have to deep dive, I guess, uh, into the concept of DAOs, um, but I think what we uh, often forget is that while uh, Bitcoin is kind of the chicken uh, and uh, the, the egg, right? Uh, wanted to create peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash, but in, in order to achieve this, we needed a kind of incentive mechanism to steer uh, untrusted actors in the network. We tied this incentive mechanism to the creation rules of the token. So as such, the Bitcoin uh, token is a purpose-driven token. And the purpose is to enable a peer-to-peer uh, um, collectively maintained peer-to-peer -peer payment network. Now, um, one step back again, if we think of like this blockchain protocol, blockchain networks that provide the basis for, um, for example, the Bitcoin system, uh, we have different metaphors. So one metaphor is a distributed ledger. That describes kind of the fact that we can collectively manage tokens. Another me metaphor is DAO it describes the organizational structure of what we're doing. And then we uh, call the also blockchains are referred to as universal state uh, machines uh, uh, because the purpose ultimately is to provide a universal state. But in order to uh, kind of achieve this uh, purpose, I need an incentive mechanism. And this, as I said before, is uh, tied to the governance rules uh, of the token, and it allows us to steer, automatically steer, uh, once defined, uh, network actors can be steered according to these rules. These purpose-driven tokens, uh, A, incentivize individual behavior, B, towards a collective instance of intermediaries. And the purpose can be a universal state, but uh, I think uh, the most intriguing part of proof of work, uh, we, we tend to focus on proof of work and alternatives to proof of work uh, to create universal straits. But I think what uh, Bitcoin and, and proof of work has also inspired us to maybe think one step beyond of different uh, other purposes that we could achieve uh, if we create um, the kind of mechanisms to collectively achieve a um, kind of uh, collective goal in the absence of intermediaries. And this purpose or collective goal could be, for example, a decentralized social network, uh, such as Steemit, and we'll look at this a bit later. It could be the collective curation of a list, of, for example, best movies or um, um, a list of many other things. Now, these lists can be more subjective or more objective and depending on what the purpose of uh, kind of the collective purpose of what I want to collectively maintain or achieve is, uh, the mechanism behind that purpose needs to be different. Uh, another um, um, a goal could be the reduction of CO2 uh, the, because this would provide better air quality, uh, we could uh, create mechanisms that incentivize collective action towards uh, CO2 emission reduction. However, all these goals or purposes uh, need different mechanisms. Now, if we look at the history of proof of work um, upon which Bitcoin was created, this didn't, didn't kind of come out of thin air, right? Um, there were decades of research in different academic fields that led up to the creation of Bitcoin uh, uh, proof of works uh, protocol. Um, and uh, a lot of time and effort and academic rigor was invested um, into coming up with such a resilient mechanism. Um, as I said, de decades of research in peer-to-peer -peer networks, in cryptography, in game theory, mechanism design, and uh, all of which ultimately uh, in various iteration phases leading up to a point led to proof of work. Now, one of the reasons I think that this tokenized economy is failing every time that we try to 
create some complex systems is that we don't invest the same amount of academic rigor that we invested when, uh, uh, or the, the kind of creators of Bitcoin, um, uh, or the people who conceptualize uh, the ideas of Bitcoin invested in creating the system. Um, for example, if we look at uh, uh, decentralized uh, social networks like Steemit. But before we get to the details of this lack of rigor, um, another thing, uh, we talk about decentralization, and this is a, um, I would like to propose um, an alternative word to decentralization because ultimately um, it's a misleading because a blockchain network is not decentralized apart from the fact that uh, the power structures are not as decentralized as, as maybe one would like or as many people would like, um, while it is to a certain extent physically and um, uh, decentralized and also geographically decentralized, um, independent of the level of this decentralization, it's always highly decentralized code. So I think that decentralization is very misleading. And if we think of like purpose-driven tokens trying to achieve a collective goal, it's about collective value creation. And this is much more maybe powerful as a word than collective value creation uh, than decentralization. Um, okay, but back to... Um, back to the storyline. So DAOs and uh, the first DAO, as I said, uh, was Bitcoin can be seen as a tech enabled or tech driven public good. So as opposed to our current economic system that incentivizes individual value creation predominantly, um, mostly in the form of private goods. And uh, some of you might know uh, this graphic here, um, um, Eleanor Ostrom uh, was uh, the researcher, uh, one of the researchers who, who um, investigated the theory of um, public goods and common goods uh, and, and tried to create a framework for goods that are not predominantly privately produced and rivalrous and excludable. Because if we look at our current economic systems, most of the goods we produce today in uh, 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 are private goods, um, and uh, they're excludable and they're rivalrous. Um, we do have a certain amount of public goods. Usually they're um, provided and produced by intermediary inter institutions on a national or regional level, si sometimes by private institutions, especially in the last 30 years, a lot of these public goods were privatized but traditionally, they used to be uh, healthcare systems, um, uh, railroads, I don't know, um, uh, education systems, etc. Um, be public goods or are public goods, and they're um, maintained uh, or governed by institutions uh, and paid for through taxpayers' money. Then we have the commons, which are also a sort of uh, public goods. This is uh, like uh, common um, um, uh, natural resources that we share and that are uh, that can be more or less uh, rivalrous depending on of how much depletion they have seen. And then we have the concept of club goods, uh, which have some artificial limitations, uh, a good that could be uh, non rivalrous you decide to give it some digital rights management like any kind of Netflix membership or satellite TV before Netflix we have satellite TV it would be something uh, uh, would be a club good in theory anyone it doesn't cost you anything to broadcast it to everyone but you you want to limit it only to the members of, of that club so in the context of blockchain networks we have something very interesting happening because we have um, for the first time, uh, or correct me if I'm wrong, maybe I missed something, but uh, I feel the proof of work uh, and Bitcoin have enabled us to currently cr uh, create and maintain a public good in the absence of intermediaries. While having, this is a very powerful revolution. And I think this is something uh, that is too little talked about. And there is more we can learn from this certain type of collective value creation while incentivizing the individual for their 
actions towards this collective goal. Now, um, I think the uh, mechanisms, uh, resilient mechanisms that have been de uh, developed, uh, the most resilient mechanism uh, uh, is probably proof of work and var variations thereof, proof of stake, and then uh, the rest is still quite in an experimental stage for creating a universal state layer for some kind of peer-to-peer -peer, um, 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 value transfer, computing, etc. But we can, as I said, use uh, this concept and try to create, for example, decentralized or uh, publicly maintained social media networks uh, to juxtapose the systems that we have today uh, that are main uh, maintained by centralized uh, institutions like uh, public institutions. Uh, private institutions like Facebook, Twitter, and uh, the private owners of the companies that operate the social media, media networks that we have today. Steemit is a very interesting use case because it has been up and online and operational since four years, and it has been it has a user base. Um, unfortunately, um, the token design uh, is a very good. It's, it's a good use case for how mechanism design goes wrong. Because the purpose, uh, um, the, the the design of the tokens, unfortunately, does not um, um, uh, is not attack resistant, and the assumptions upon which uh, the design assumptions um, um, seem to have been wrong, and this is what we see. One of the design assumptions. Well, apart from the fact that Steemit was obviously conceptualized at a very very early stage. Um, that was even before, or more or less, roughly at the same time when um, Ethereum went online. Um, they have a very complex uh, token design and uh, three different token types, simply because uh, back then um, it was innovative at its time. It has its own stable token and its own uh, blockchain infrastructure this would not be possible and we're seeing newer social media networks uh, decentralized social media networks very often don't operate their own blockchain infrastructure um, but apart from the complexities of having the three different to token times uh, types the most important token in that uh, uh, steam ecosystem is um, the reputation token steam power and the reputation token has been designed upon um, design assumptions that uh, is um, uh, uh, upon design assumptions that are very in economics new um, kind of uh, neoclassical economics and kind of it assumes the rational uh, uh, behavior of economic actors and perfect selfishness and uh, which in economics uh, other schools of economics have proven that uh, is not always perfectly true. It's one type of behavior amongst a set of different behaviors. So uh, the mechanism of uh, Steemit uh, is based on uh, partially false assumptions, uh, and the design of the properties uh, is, uh, as a result, uh, also uh, doesn't meet uh, the ends because uh, the reputation token is transferable. It's not tied to your identity which you can buy reputation and sell reputation. Um, and um, it seems that uh, in order to have a good reputation system in a social network, you would need to tie this to the identity of the person. Um, we can't go into the details of uh, properly, how to properly design a social media uh, token uh, with a resilient mechanism design. And um, not only because we don't have the time, but because we have um, this is an area of applied research that needs much more rigorous work. And um, unfortunately, for what it's worth, STEAM, it seems to be, they had a very good idea and they put a lot of effort in it, uh, but uh, we will see whether they might will be successful apart from the fact that they recently had a hostile takeover. Um, I think they have really fundamental design flaws uh, in their um, economic system. Um, another collectively maintaining uh, a public infrastructure could be the concept, for example, uh, concepts of token curated registries. Uh, we don't see too many applications out there yet, uh, some, um, but uh, um, basically it's about collectively maintaining uh, uh, 
a, a list a curation of a list of something um, uh, or it could be a list or a um, we cannot deep dive into that, but if you're interested um, in token curated registries, there is quite a lot online. Um, for those who have my book, there is a whole chapter on TCRs in my book. Um, but we will need much more research on token curated registries and uh, applied research and also some modeling, what Chris and Shruti have been talking about before. Uh, we are... Take a research uh, we have the means to model these things and 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 simulate uh, these economies or these mechanisms that we want to and, and test them before we deploy them so basic attention token won't don't want to go into detail unfortunately it's not really it could be a purpose-driven token but uh, to steer an autonomous network of actors uh, it does have a purpose uh, it's used for the advertising industry it's a very interesting use case but I fear that the economics behind the token might be flawed because it's steered by a centralized system, which is basically the company that gave out the tokens in an initial token sale. So while the idea is great um, and they, they are doing a fantastic job with the browser and everything, it, we, will, we will see whether the design assumptions of their tokens will be resilient in the long term. The token is more an asset-backed token pegged to our current system than kind of a proof of attention token that is minted upon behavior. Uh, I would like to conclude in um, uh, uh, the use cases with what we've been trying to build in Vienna um, was the Kultur token, which was a... Um, kind of a, a proof of concept for how a city could use a tokenized incentive to create a collection. And one, uh, and this proof of concept was basically about incentivizing CO2 emission reduction uh, and rewarding the tokens that you could then use for cultural activities for the city. We started designing the system a, a year and a half ago. Um, and uh, together with the city of Vienna, the city of Vienna is uh, kind of the project lead and they've been operating this, but the universities and we and other institutions were part of this. And uh, the design process of, of conceptualizing a CO2 token that could be rewarded with uh, cultural activities took us one and a half years. And beginning of January, um, uh, we launched a like, limited test uh, use case um, uh, with a, a kind of a closed beta. Uh, and uh, we, unfortunately, because of current uh, events, uh, uh, COVID, we, uh, this, uh, this project stopped. One is that this design process of how we could create this purpose-driven token and the purpose of the token is CO2 emission reduction. Uh, it took many researchers of various academic fields to sit together. We had lawyers, uh, uh, kind of behavioral economists, um, um, environmental scientists, etc. the city of Vienna and the institutions uh, all come together in, in an iteration of meetings, uh, conceptualize this system uh, put kind of uh, bring it um, technically implement it. What we wanted to do now was test this system and and then start fine tuning the system um, from this kind of test use case. Unfortunately, uh, it's on hold on ice until September. We will then see, hopefully, after uh, our current events. Um, uh, So it's hard to foresee uh, what will happen. Okay, to conclude the last few slides. Um, the Web3 with these blockchain networks um, enables us, the, the blockchain networks themselves are systems in specific complex socioeconomic systems that are adaptive, adaptive networks that are multi-scale in time and space. And these are as Chris already said in the beginning, a few talks ago, um, complex economic systems that come with a real-time data set of what is happening in that economy. 
but not only on the protocol layer of the blockchain systems themselves, but also on the application layer of the applications that, that use the blockchain uh, or a blockchain network as the backbone for settling transactions. So uh, whatever token, uh, independent of which token economy we built, um, these tokenized economies come with a real time or almost real time data set of what is happening happening in that economy, which means that, uh, okay, I'm showing the wrong thing. Um, yeah, which means that we can steer these economies in uh, much more also real time than the economic, current economic systems that we're steering. So we have, as Chris already said, we have the microeconomic kind of uh, agent le level behavior, we have the system le level behavior the ma uh, where we build the macroeconomic models and uh, in the middle on this mesoeconomic uh, um, kind of the, the measurements of the policy goals and then the policy implementation results uh, from kind of a human decision making process um, uh, that feedbacks into the agent level behavior. Now we can have automated kind of the mechanism. The mechanism design automates part of this feedback loop. Um, in the case of Bitcoin, it would be the difficult controller. Uh, but every now and then we need to upgrade the system. We need to change the protocol rules. And when we do that, this feedback loop and the policy goal setting will be a off-chain uh, human process of um, policy goal setting and then implementation. And um, so I think this area of research is also very, very important uh, in the years to come. Now, uh, as I said, in order to design a resilient mechanism design, um, we need to A, um, uh, make sure we know, you know, um, whether the assumptions made um, are correct, uh, because a resilient mechanism design uh, depends on the resilience of the assumptions made on how network actors react to economic incentives. And how network actors or people react to incentives has been a field of study of economics for a long, long time. So the relevant fields of knowledge to design tokenized ecosystems is A, economics, uh, and economics is not a monolithic field. Uh, we have neoclassical economics, micro macroeconomics, but uh, we also have a growing body of uh, heterodox economics like behavioral economics, behavioral finance, behavioral game theory, institutional economics, complexity economics, etc. So there are many tools that we can take from uh, these fields of study and knowledge. Uh, in engineering, there is a lot also we can take uh, and learn from engineering beyond computer sci science, from cyber physical systems to electric engineering, so robo robotics uh, uh, and AI, but also from public. And what we should talk about in the context of the Web3 is social technical systems, because in the end, blockchain networks and their applications are social technical systems. The, the, the kind of uh, technological part is only one part. And here are all the domains that would be necessary. Why is this important to have other fields like economics in this design process? Because we have problems like free rider problems, um, challenges such as positive, uh, most importantly, negative externalities, uh, things we know about from behavioral economics, regret theory, hyperbolic discounting, prospect theory. We know about um, mental shortcuts that people do in their decision making processes, and we need to model them into uh, the economics of our purpose driven tokens. So, how to design a token? There are three steps A, define the purpose, B, define the properties. Um, so we need to talk more about potential properties of a token, like fungibility, transferability, privacy, durability, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These are just a few examples. And from those properties and the purpose, I can now derive the mechanism. And in this process of uh, um, kind of and this engineering process uh, has four different um, um, areas. Uh, one is one of them is technical engineering. And I think uh, we today, if we look at most um, teams in the crypto field, 
they have too many computer scientists and they they lack the other people that we also need and i think this is why most projects are currently failing um, not only because we have bad actors because uh, but also because we don't have the right people in the teams that are building these systems proper economics systems and their applications apart from the technical engineering where i look at uh technical aspects from security scalability privacy uh token standard interoperability etc cetera, etc cetera. obviously these are things that we need to consider and when implementing a token system and we need computer scientists many uh um computer scientists to design that but if we have teams of 100% computer scientists we will never be able to create the right mechanism design because what we write in the code is usually especially when it's an application level token that um um uh, involves more human interaction than maybe a consensus mechanism needs we have more um uh, we need more public policy design and um here we need legal engineering processes these are especially relevant as i outlined before in simple token systems where we know the dynamics or the governance models uh, of uh, these systems like identity currency assets and the tokenization uh, kind of uh, involves uh, to make it technically tokenize it in a technical way but then also make it make it legally compliant this is a matter of jurisdiction relevant regulation um, and uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. so here we need uh, a lot of people with legal studies as a background in the teams and we don't only we need usually probably more than one person um especially in the re context of uh, complex systems and purpose driven tokens uh we need more people from the fields of economics uh, as outlined before but also network science cyber physical systems and i have the list before so we don't have to deep dive into that anymore and then obviously we have a wide range of ethical uh, uh sociological ethical questions um, mostly in the context of blockchain systems they revolve around transparency versus privacy and power structures this is not something a computer scientist alone can decide we do have enough body of knowledge in different uh, fields and um unless the team structures don't change in the crypto field we will have projects that will continuously fail because they don't have the right people to build these resilient protocols yeah so i think i'm at the end of my uh, talk I wrote a great, I tried to kind of contextualize all these things I said in my book, Token Economy, and then the papers that I've been writing in my academic work, uh, Token Economy is less academic. Um, yeah, and I'm open to questions now, if there is some more time, a few minutes, I think. Yeah, there are a couple of minutes left. First, thank you for your talk. And we have uh, already some questions in the chat, yeah. so I'll pick them up. First question, can we consider that collective value allocation is a necessary corollary to collective value creation for decentralized systems in order to achieve mainstream use and resilience in the long term? Yes, um, I, I think we would need to discuss this. In, in, uh, I need more context to that question, mm -hmm. but I'm happy to discuss this uh, with the person who um, uh, after the talk with the person just shoot me an email maybe uh or a message okay. uh, right. yes i we'll do that. So, so. go ahead oh no I, I just said yeah okay we'll send you an email yeah that would be great um yes i in fact uh this would be an an area of research my, I, I would personally like to build my research on purpose-driven tokens and uh, that would be a valid question right um we're at, yeah. Cool. We'll be in touch. Awesome. There is another comment uh, Grace made. I don't know, Grace, are you in the channel so that you can also comment directly? Oh, sure. Yeah, so you mentioned like there isn't enough research done, and I feel like there are is a lot of research done, and you mentioned that at the end as well. I think mostly what's happening with crypto economics is that we're ignoring it. 
And I think that oh, also oh, what when did you, you say? talk about I purpose, what, right? What is, what is happening? I think that there's a lot of research. Yeah. Like, you know, there's there's a lot of research that's been done and you mentioned it at the end, but during your talk, you were saying how there isn't enough research done. I think that actually we're just ignoring all of this research about socioeconomic well, yeah, I think that, that It doesn't spill over. So, yes, I mean, there is we have a lot of research is being done um, detached from crypto economics and the Web3, right? So we have a body of research, and this is what we've been trying to do at the Crypto Economics Research Lab in Vienna at our institute, to kind of um, pool the different areas uh, of knowledge necessary to start building tokenized ecosystems. Right. We do have this body of knowledge, but usually what I've been like, we started the, the research lab two years ago. We have a set of economists uh, in all these fields that I mentioned, but they don't understand Web3. And so uh, the, the problem that I'm finding is that the developer community is very detached from the researcher community, but also the researcher community. Uh, uh, they they know all these, I mean, we have these uh, sciences and all these fields of knowledge, but we don't have the spillover to the uh, development part of the Web3 networks. And at the same time, uh, on the startup side, um, oh, I think there is still a great level of, uh, I, I will say it bluntly, ignorance uh, towards everything that is not computer science. Um, I think a lot of teams or C-level positions or founders of teams uh, think that um, um, it is enough to hire one economist, it's enough to hire one lawyer, when in fact you need like 25%, 25%, 25%, 25% in, uh, of all four different domains if, if you're creating a complex uh, system uh, and in, in, in the case of simple token systems you probably need predominantly like 50% computer scientists and 50% lawyers. It's not enough to have one lawyer. So I think we need um, the spillover A between academia and startups, which we also try to do uh, at the research lab. Uh, most of our work is uh, externally funded, which means that we always have to be very applied in our work. Uh, but um, unless there is not a um, um, sensitivity on the startup side or on the on the founder side that computer science is just not enough um uh we uh, we will not have uh the the right team members and team composition well can i just ask one follow-on question why do you think lawyers are important they don't understand economics at all well uh for simple complex uh, for simple token systems if i want to tokenize an a security token i don't need economics i need lawyers I outlined this uh, in my last slide. If you're interested, um, uh, I did my last post uh, that I published on Medium is on the different token systems and what team members you need. So if you're tokenizing a security token, you don't need a great deal of economics. You need economics, especially when you're creating complex token systems, where you're steering an autonomous network of actors, like in a decentralized social media network, or uh, like uh, uh, yeah, Bitcoin or Ethereum, network this is when you have autonomous actors this is when you need economics but if you're just simply tokenizing a security token uh, and that's not simple you need there is a myriad of legal techno legal questions and you need lawyers and uh when designing uh uh the complex systems obviously you have a lot of ethical questions we have people who have studied um you know um um, you know, the, uh, there are many legal and ethical questions also uh, necessary to consider when designing complex systems. So I, I would say that if you're designing a simple token system where you're basically tokenizing identities, where you're tokenizing securities, uh, assets, access rights, things uh, that we're already doing today, you mainly need software developers and lawyers. If you're tokenizing, uh, if you're creating completely new value creation systems, uh, these complex systems that I was mentioning around purpose-driven tokens, then you need a um, kind of uh, probably a team where you have, you need many uh, computer scientists, but you would need an equal amount of economists and uh, a few 
lawyers uh, from the different legal studies, especially when it comes to privacy. Uh, we do have, in a data-driven economies, we always have privacy issues, and it's also a legal question. So obviously, you also need lawyers. Um, and um, yeah, so I think that coming out of the Web 1 and the Web 2, which has been dominated by Silicon Valley and this very quick and dirty mentality to create a code, pivot from there, this is not something that we can do in the Web 3, where everybody has a stake in the system, because if you have a bug in the code, if you build your kind of uh, economy on false assumptions, as we're seeing, unfortunately, from, uh, from, from Steemit, uh, people lose money because eventually the network will decline. Uh, and, uh, or, or if you have a bug in the code, uh, 150 million gone, 50 million gone here in Multisig, etc. So we need a different um, approach in this Web3 than we needed in maybe the Web uh the internet until now okay i think fruity has raised her hands so you want to add some Anything? yeah i i also want to address the question of the fact that um i mean the, the claim that there is not a lot of research um in crypto economics so it is true that actually the the field of crypto economics is is very much emerging and when one claims that there is a lot of research associated with you know sociology economics etc like all of those fields do exist and there is plenty of research there. However, there is nothing, not a lot of um, papers that are written in the field of bridging those concepts and bringing yeah. them over to the field of crypto systems. And that is essentially what we are trying to do in, with Crypto Economics Lab as well as a few other researchers associated. So we are building the bridge um, that connects all of these really um, theoretical concepts into over to crypto economic systems. And when we think of crypto economic systems as well, there are certain properties associated with them. The fact that they are um, frictionless, that you know contracts can be made in like two minutes, not like in the real world where it takes a long time. Mm -hmm. And then the fact that um, they are strictly enforceable, meaning that um, any contract that is made has to definitely be um, obeyed in order for the transaction to pass. And a few other properties as well, which are special to crypto economic systems that we didn't see in traditional economic systems. And in order to, you know, um, design designed and bring over the, all of these different principles from traditional subjects such as sociology, um, um, psychology, socioeconomics, et cetera, like we need to form the bridges. And that's essentially what the crypto economics lab is doing and a whole body of researchers is also developing. So we are spawning the new subject of crypto economics, especially with the eyes of complexity. Um, if you would like to refer a little bit more, the field of complexity economics actually yeah. spawned out of this new way of thinking of complexity. Yeah, uh, maybe, economics. It's, this yeah, is maybe Shruti, you can also mention how, I mean, economics, as I said, is not a monolithic field, right? There are so many different schools of economics. And uh, the 20th century has been very much marked by a very predominantly uh, uh, certain school of economics uh, that some people refer to as neoclassical economics, very using very often using reductionist tools to model our economic systems, right? Uh, and uh, why? Because it grew out of a time where we didn't have computers, we didn't have data sets. Uh, the data we model our economic systems upon is often collected after the fact. Um, and we have um, a scattered data sets. Uh, we have these and and there is we had complexity economics uh, and other schools of economics with alternative assumptions about how actors in an economy behave to modeling these things but we've never had the tool set that we have today which is all these machine learning algorithms on one hand but what uh, the web3 brings in specific as shruti said is uh, is a very new conditions which is this real time data set upon which we can have more um uh, sophisticated feedback loops right yeah just, you, just a brief uh, comment um the the video stream on youtube might be interrupted now but we can continue in this channel so ju let, just let's go ahead with the discussion until 10 past and then the the next talk 
is going to start. Yes, yeah, sorry, shoot. And we have another one who wanted to add something from the audience. But Trudy, you first. Oh, I'm in agreement. I don't have comments to make. But yes, uh, yeah, I agree with the points that were said. Perfect. So there was, I think, Cyprien wanted to also raise a question. Yes, correct. Okay. Um, quick question. Why did you say exactly that you think that the uh, uh, economics behind that are flawed? Um, well, it's a. Uh, I think that uh, I'm assuming this. Okay, it's not um, so bad. I'm a big fan of the project uh, for two reasons. I, I have to say that before I criticize it. Right, okay. I'm a big fan of the system because a like having big data in a privacy preserving. Like, a privacy preserving browser having kind of personalized ads that are are conducted in a privacy preserving manner um, that is amazing being incentivized dis uh, directly for your attention disintermediating the industry um, uh, that is amazing so the, the, the idea um, the value proposition is correct and how they're doing it on a technical level uh, is correct. I, I think BAT is also one of the older projects, let's say. It's more the se one of the more seasoned projects, even though it's still in the making. And um, the economics behind it are based on uh, economics of the private firm. Whereas they're trying to create uh, where uh, you have like uh, like how the economy in the 20th century was built upon the concept of the theory of the firm and the firm has private shareholders and they have uh, they they decide upon what what happens and maybe if it's a post IPO you will have some as a minority shareholder, also some voting rights sometimes uh, uh, at the an annual convention, etc. But uh, you can't really steer the network. We have, um, whereas um, blockchain and the Web3 introduced us, uh, gave us a governance layer for having coordinating in the absence of intermediaries across jurisdictions and collectively maintaining a system. And that is not collectively maintained. Is like a centralized system as opposed to Steemit. Now, if you uh, unfortunately, the Steemit has other design flaws, uh, but Steemit at least uh, was a community driven uh, or still is a community driven uh, the fork off. Um, things happen. So uh, it's still a, a community driven ecosystem. So when the majority of the network actors said, hey, this is flawed. They have like 20 or 30 forks until now, right? Um, because, and, and they were community driven for the most part. Um, in, with that, it's like a private company. And the economics are based on a pre-sale that was conducted of tokens, a limited amount of tokens that are out there, and some economics that are tied to our fiat system. So the per, as opposed to, for example, the Bitcoin token that is minted upon proof of work, uh, you contributed to the security of the network, uh, um, you get a token and this, this, and, and, and this is when the token is minted, uh, uh, as is uh, Steam it, right? Uh, or at least on, on the blockchain level, uh, uh, or the Steam, also the Steam power tokens and the Steam dollar tokens. It's just uh, the, it has other design flaws. Or for example, a CO2 token, the one we conceptualized in Vienna, if you could prove that you rode a bike instead of go taking the car and um, if you, once you saved one C kilogram of CO2, uh, um, of CO2, you would get a token, right? So the token is minted upon proof of certain behavior. It's not pegged to a fiat currency in a token sale. Do you understand what I mean? So I think, um, um, the Web3 is a more a socio-economic revolution than it is a technical revolution. The technical system is just the base layer and it allows us to do completely new things beyond simply tokenizing assets like securities or identities or, uh, or, or uh, entry tickets. And, um, and this new thing that we can do, these purpose-driven tokens that are minted upon behavior 
are a completely new type of value creation. And I think that in the conceptualization of the BAT token, they didn't consider that. They thought Web2 when creating a system, token system for the Web3. And this is where I think they might fail in the long run. Might, right? I don't know. I don't have the glass ball. But something feels off. Uh, it's, it's similar to maybe, do you, I don't know how old you are. Do you remember Yahoo? Yeah, of course. OK, so I don't know. I don't know how old you are. So uh, Yahoo tried to catalog content. Like It was like before there was algorithmic search. Uh, they tried to manually, they had this army of people manually kind of cataloging content uh, as if it were a library, right? Um, so it took the whole search engine industry, all these startups that uh, created uh, search engines. Um, it, it took a while until people understood that this doesn't scale, that we need algorithmic search and other methods to rank content in the sea of information because it's not a library uh, it's not binary if you have one book you can only put it in one category but but like it, it's different it's a different technology so they then realized that you can now use computer algorithms because it's computer-based systems uh, to rank information online and this is when then the likes of Google uh, and why Google took over uh, the search engine market, in fact, uh, because it had the better solution that was more scalable and more indicative. And I think something similar may, might happen to BAT because they, they are like Yahoo. They're trying to tokenize the system. They're doing the right thing, right? Yahoo had a great idea. We need to to uh, people need to find information online, but the way they did it was not appropriate. And maybe BAT will face a similar problem with its uh, token economics.